Chapter 6 International Organizations In this chapter we shall discuss the role of international organizations after the collapse of the Soviet Union. We shall examine how in this emerging world there were calls for the restructuring of international organizations to cope with various new challenges including the rise of US power. The potential reform of the United Nations Security Council is an interesting case of the reform process and its difficulties. We then turn to India's involvement in the UN and its view of Security Council reforms. The chapter closes by asking if the UN can play any role in dealing with a world dominated by one superpower. In this chapter, we also look at some other transnational organizations that are playing a crucial role. Why International Organizations? Read the two cartoons on this page. Both the cartoons comment on the ineffectiveness of the United Nations organizations, usually referred to as the UN. In the Lebanon crisis in 2006, both the cartoons represent the kind of opinions that we often hear about the UN. On the other hand, we also find that the UN is generally regarded as the most important international organization in today's world. In the eyes of many people all over the world, it is indispensable and represents the great hope of humanity for peace and progress. Why do we then need organizations like the UN? Let us hear two insiders. The United Nations was not created to take humanity to heaven but to save it from hell. Dag Hammarskjöld, the UN's second secretary general. Talking shop. Yes, there are a lot of speeches and meetings at the UN, especially during the annual sessions of the General Assembly. But as Churchill put it, jaw jaw is better than war war. Isn't it better to have one place where all countries in the world can get together, pour each other sometimes with their words, rather than bore holes into each other on the battlefield. Sashi Tharur, the former UN Under Secretary General for Communications and Public Information. These two quotes suggest something important. International organizations are not the answer to everything, but they are important. International organizations help with matters of war and peace. They also help countries cooperate to make better living conditions for us all. Countries have conflicts and differences with each other that does not necessarily mean they must go to war to deal with their antagonisms. They can instead discuss contentious issues and find peaceful solutions. Indeed, even though this is really noticed, most conflicts and differences are resolved without going to war. The role of an international organization can be important in this context. An international organization is not a super state with authority over its members. It is created by and responds to states. It comes into being when states agree to its creation. Once created, it can help member states resolve their problems peacefully. International organizations are helpful in another way. Nations can usually see that there are some things they must do together. There are issues that are so challenging that they can only be dealt with when everyone works together. Disease is an example. Some diseases can only be eradicated if everyone in the world cooperates in inoculating or vaccinating their populations or take global warming and its effects. As temperature rise because of the increase in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, there is a danger that sea levels will also rise, thereby submerging many coastal areas of the world, including huge cities. Of course, each country can try to find its own solution to the effects of global warming, but in the end, a more effective approach is to stop the warming itself. This requires at least all of the major industrial powers to cooperate. Unfortunately, recognizing the need for cooperation and actually cooperating are two different things. Nations can recognize the need to cooperate but cannot always agree on how best to do so. 
how to share the cost of cooperating how to make sure that the benefits of cooperating are justly divided and how to ensure that others do not break their end of the bargain and cheat on an agreement an international organization can help produce information and ideas about how to cooperate it can provide mechanisms rules and a bureaucracy to help members have more confidence that cost will be shared properly that the benefits will be fairly divided and that once a member joins an agreement it will honor the terms and conditions of the agreement with the end of the cold war we can see that the un may have a slightly different role as the united states and its allies emerge victorious there was concern amongst many governments and peoples that the western countries led by the us would be so powerful that there would be no check against their wishes and desires can the un serve to promote dialogue and discussion with the us in particular and could it limit the power of the american government we shall try to answer this question at the end of the chapter evolution of the un the first world war encouraged the world to invest in an international organization to deal with conflict many believed that such an organization would help the world to avoid war as a result the league of nations was born however despite its initial success it could not prevent the second world war many more people died and were wounded in this war than ever before the un was founded as a successor to the league of nations it was established in 1945 immediately after the second world war the organization was set up through the signing of the united nations charter by 51 states it tried to achieve what the league could not between the two world wars the un's objective is to prevent international conflict and to facilitate cooperation among states it was founded with the hope that it would act to stop the conflicts between states escalating into war and if war broke out to limit the extent of hostilities furthermore since conflicts often arouse from the lack of social and economic development the un was intended to bring countries together to improve the prospects of social and economic development all over the world by 2006 the un had 192 member states these included almost all independent states in the un general assembly all members have one vote each in the un security council there are five permanent members these are the united states russia the united kingdom france and china these states were selected as permanent members as they were the most powerful immediately after the second world war and because they constituted the victors in the war the un's most visible public figure and the representative head is the secretary general the present secretary general is antonio guterres he is the ninth secretary general of the un he took over as the secretary general on 1 january 2017 he was the prime minister of portugal 1995 to 2002 and the un high commissioner for refugees 2005 to 2015 the un consists of many different structures and agencies war and peace and differences between member states are discussed in the general assembly as well as the security council social and economic issues are dealt with by many agencies including the world health organization the united nations development program the united nations human rights Con- commission the united nations high commission for refugees the united nations children's fund and the united nations educational scientific and cultural organization among others reform of the un after the cold war reform and improvement are fundamental to any organization to serve the needs of a changing environment the un is no exception in recent years there have been demands for reforms of the world body however there is little clarity and consensus on the nature of reform two basic kinds of reforms face the un 
reform of the organization structures and processes and a review of the issues that fall within the jurisdiction of the organization almost everyone is agreed that both aspects of reform are necessary what they cannot agree on is precisely what is to be done how it is to be done and when it is to be done on the reform of structures and processes the biggest discussion has been on the functioning of the security council related to this has been the demand for an increase in the un security council's permanent and non permanent membership so that the realities of contemporary world politics are better reflected in the structure of the organization in particular there are proposals to increase membership from asia africa and south america beyond this the us and other western countries want improvements in the un budgetary procedures and its administration on the issues to be given greater priority or to be brought within the jurisdiction of the un some countries and experts want the organization to play a greater or more effective role in peace and security missions while others want its role to be confined to development and humanitarian work health education environment population control human rights gender and social justice let us look at both sets of reforms with an emphasis on reform of the structures and processes the un was established in 1945 immediately after the second world war the way it was organized and the way it functioned reflected the realities of world politics after the second world war after the cold war those realities are different here are some of the changes that have occurred the soviet union has collapsed the us is the strongest power the relationship between russia the successor to the soviet union and the us is much more cooperative china is fast emerging as a great power and india also is growing rapidly the economies of asia are growing at an unprecedented rate many new countries have joined the un as they became independent from the soviet union or former communist states in eastern europe a whole new set of challenges confronts the world genocide civil war ethnic conflict terrorism nuclear proliferation climate change environmental degradation epidemics in this situation in 1989 as the cold war was ending the question facing the world was is the un doing enough is it equipped to do what is required what should it be doing and how what reforms are necessary to make it work better for the past decade and a half member states have been trying to find satisfactory and practical answers to these questions reform of structures and processes while the case for reform has widespread support getting agreement on what to do is difficult let us examine the debate over reform of the un security council in 1992 The UN General Assembly adopted a resolution. The resolution reflected three main complaints. The Security Council no longer represents contemporary political realities. Its decision reflect only western values and interest and are dominated by a few powers. It lacks equitable representation. In view of these growing demands for the restructuring of the UN on 1 January 1997 The UN Secretary General Kofi Annan initiated an inquiry into how the UN should be reformed how for instance should new security council members be chosen in the year since then the following are just some of the criteria that have been proposed for new permanent and non permanent members of the security council a new member it has been suggested should be a major economic power a major military power a substantial contributor to the un budget a big nation in terms of its population a nation that respects democracy and human rights a country that would make the council more representative of the world's diversity in terms of geography economic systems and culture clearly each of these criteria has some validity government saw advantages in some criteria and disadvantages in other depending on their interest 
and aspirations even if they had no desire to be members themselves countries could see that the criteria were problematic how big an economy or military power did you have to be to qualify for security council membership what level of budget contribution would enable a state to buy its way into the council was a big population an asset or a liability for a country trying to play a bigger role in the world if respect for democracy and human right was the criteria countries with excellent records would be in line to be members but would they be effective as council members furthermore how was the matter of representation to be resolved did equitable representation in geographical terms mean that there should be one seat each from asia africa and latin america and the caribbean should the representation on the other hand be by regions or sub regions rather than continents why should the issue of equitable representation be decided by geography why not by levels of economic development why not in other words give more seats to members of the developing world even here there are difficulties the developing world consists of countries at many different levels of development what about culture should different cultures or civilizations be given representation in a more balanced way how does one divide the world by civilizations or cultures given that nations have so many cultural streams within their borders a related issue was to change the nature of membership altogether some insisted for instance that the veto power of the five permanent members be abolished many perceived the veto to be in conflict with the concept of democracy and sovereign equality in the un and thought that the veto was no longer right or relevant in the security council there are five permanent members and 10 non permanent members the charter gave the permanent members a privileged position to bring about stability in the world after the second world war the main privileges of the five permanent members are permanency and the veto power the non permanent members serve for only 2 years at a time and give way after that period to the newly elected members a country cannot be re-elected immediately after completing a term of 2 years the non permanent members are elected in a manner so that they represent all continents of the world most importantly the non permanent members do not have the veto power what is the veto power in taking decisions the security council proceeds by voting all members have one vote however the permanent members can vote in a negative manner so that even if all other permanent and non permanent members vote for a particular decision any permanent members negative vote can stall the decision this negative vote is the veto while there has been a move to abolish or modify the veto system there is also a realization that the permanent members are unlikely to agree to such a reform also the world may not be ready for such a radical step even though the cold war is over without the veto there is the danger as in 1945 that the great powers would lose interest in the world body that they would do what they pleased outside it and that without their support and involvement the body would be ineffective jurisdiction of the un the question of membership is a serious one in addition though there are more substantial issues before the world as the un completed 60 years of its existence the heads of all the member states met in september 2005 to celebrate the anniversary and review the situation the leaders in this meeting decided that the following step should be taken to make the un more relevant in the changing context creation of a peace building commission acceptance of the responsibility of the international community in case of failures of national governments to protect their own citizens from atrocities establishment of a human rights council operational since 19 june 2006 agreements to achieve the millennium development goals condemnation of terrorism in all its form and manifestations creation of a democracy fund an agreement to wind up the trusteeship council
it is not hard to see that these are equally contentious issues for the UN. What should a peace building commission do? There are any number of conflicts all over the world. Which one should it intervene in? Is it possible or even desirable for it to intervene? In each and every conflict, similarly, what is the responsibility of the international community in dealing with atrocities? What are human rights and who should determine the level of human rights violations and the course of actions to be taken when they are violated? Given that so many countries are still part of the developing world, how realistic is it for the UN to achieve an ambitious set of goals such as those listed in the Millennium Development Goals? Can there be agreement on a definition of terrorism? How shall the UN use funds to promote democracy and so on? India and the UN Reforms India has supported the restructuring of the UN on several grounds. It believes that a strengthened and revitalized UN is desirable in a changing world. India also supports an enhanced role for the UN in promoting development and cooperation among states. India believes that development should be central to the UN's agenda as it is a vital precondition for the maintenance of international peace and security. One of India's major concern has been the composition of the Security Council which has remained largely static while the UN General Assembly membership has expanded considerably. India considers that this have harmed the representative character of the Security Council. It also argues that an expanded council with more representation will enjoy greater support in the world community. We should keep in mind that the membership of the UN Security Council was expanded from 11 to 15 in 1965, but there was no change in the number of permanent members. Since then, the size of the council has remained stationary. The fact remains that the overwhelming majority of the UN General Assembly members now are developing countries. Therefore, India argues that they should also have a role in shaping the decisions in the Security Council which affects them. India supports an increase in the number of both permanent and non-permanent members. Its representatives have argued that the activities of the Security Council have greatly expanded in the past few years. The success of the Security Council's actions depends upon the political support of the international community. Any plan for restructuring of the Security Council should therefore be broad-based. For example, the Security Council should have more developing countries in it. Not surprisingly, India itself also wishes to be a permanent member in a restructured UN. India is the second most populous country in the world, comprising almost one-fifth of the world population. Moreover, India is also the world's largest democracy. India has participated in virtually all of the initiatives of the UN. Its role in the UN's peacekeeping efforts is a long and substantial one. The country's economic emergence on the world stage is another factor that perhaps justifies India's claim to a permanent seat in the Security Council. India has also made regular financial contributions to the UN and never faltered on its payments. India is aware that permanent membership of the Security Council also has symbolic importance. It signifies a country's growing importance in world affairs. This greater status is an advantage to a country in the conduct of its foreign policy. The reputation for being powerful makes you more influential. Despite India's wish to be a permanent veto-wielding member of the UN, some countries question its inclusion. Neighboring Pakistan, with which India has troubled relation, is not the only country that is reluctant to see India become a permanent veto member of the Security Council. Some countries, for instance, are concerned about India's nuclear weapon capabilities. Other thing that its difficulties lie with Pakistan will make India ineffective as a permanent member. Yet others feel that if India is included, then other emerging powers will have to be accommodated such as Brazil, Germany, Japan, perhaps even South Africa whom they oppose. 
there are those who feel that Africa and South America must be represented in any expansion of the permanent membership since those are the only continents not to have representation in the present structure. Given these concerns, it may not be very easy for India or anyone else to become a permanent member of the UN in the near future. The UN in a unipolar world Among the concerns about the reform and restructuring of the UN has been the hope of some countries that changes could help the UN cope better with a unipolar world in which the US was the most powerful country without any serious rivals. Can the UN serve as a balance against US dominance? Can it help maintain a dialogue between the rest of the world and the US and prevent America from doing whatever it wants? US power cannot be easily checked. First of all, with the disappearance of the Soviet Union, the US stands as the only superpower. Its military and economic power allow it to ignore the UN or any other international organization. Secondly, within the UN, the influence of the US is considerable. As the single largest contributor to the UN, the US has unmatched financial power. The fact that the UN is physically located within the US territory gives Washington additional sources of influence. The US also has many nationals in the UN bureaucracy. In addition, with its veto power, the US can stop any moves that it finds annoying or damaging to its interest or the interest of its friends and allies. The power of the US and its veto within the organization also ensure that Washington has a considerable degree of say in the choice of the Secretary General of the UN. The US can and does use this power to split the rest of the world and to reduce opposition to its policies. The UN is not therefore a great balance to the US. Nevertheless, in a unipolar world in which the US is dominant, the UN can and has served to bring the US and the rest of the world into discussions over various issues. US leaders, in spite of their frequent criticism of the UN, do see the organization as serving a purpose in bringing together over 190 nations in dealing with conflict and social and economic development. As for the rest of the world, the UN provides an arena in which it is possible to modify US attitudes and policies, while the rest of the world is rarely united against Washington and while it is virtually impossible to balance US power, the UN does provise, provide a space within which Arguments against specific U.S. attitudes and policies are heard and compromises and concessions can be shaped. The U.N. is an imperfect body, but without it, the world would be worse off. Given the growing connections and links between societies and issues, what we often call interdependence, it is hard to imagine how more than 7 billion people would live together without an organization such as the U.N. Technology promises to increase planetary interdependence and therefore the importance of the UN will only increase. Peoples and governments will have to find ways of supporting and using the UN and other international organizations in ways that are consistent with their own interest and the interest of the international community more broadly.